Can we please welcome Asher again as he comes to speak with us? So thank you everyone for coming out um, this evening. I appreciate it. I think the fact that you're here is just wonderful. And I've got a bit that I'd like to sort of cover this evening. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of it in just a second. And for some of you, you'll lap that up. Having lots of content, you'll be like, fantastic. And you'll be studiously taking notes and digesting it. Others of you might feel a bit overwhelmed and think that, you know, I've only just managed to get here. Um, and can I just encourage you, both approaches are fine. If you have managed to take home everything this evening, fantastic. But if you just walk away with one thing that you want to think about or, or just apply to your family life, um, then that's fantastic too. So please don't feel that you've got to keep up with everything. Um, if you want to, great. But if there's just one or two things that really resonate for you, then jot them down and share them with someone afterwards and consolidate it in your family life. So today I'm going to be talking around emotions in children because when I think of the topic of resilience, one of the uh, biggest things that pops up when um, I'm working with children and trying to you know, encourage and build resilience is emotions or our emotions. Um, so what I'm going to do today is go through a few things with emotions in children. I'm going to start off with looking at exploring a bit about what emotions are, talking a bit about what it does in our brain, and then giving a bit of a framework for how we support children with learning how to regulate their emotions or manage their emotions. So um, I'm going to just uh, flip to the first slide. So um, this is the first diagram. Um, in case anyone wasn't sure what um, a child struggling with their emotions might look like. Um, but it comes in many shapes and sizes. It comes from the classic um, tantrum in the shopping centre, throwing things around the aisles. It comes with a child who just hits the wall with an exam and just, you can't seem to get through to them. It comes with a child who's really, really angry at you and says some things that just really shock you and scare you. Um, most of the difficult moments we have with children tends to come when their emotions seem to be um, out of control and it seemed to be taking them over. So um, let's talk about emotions. So here's the second diagram. Um, this is something that also induces terror, although not as much terror as a child in full flight, <laughs> and that is a uh, great white shark. Um, now, the reason I've got this up here is because one of the things that we have with emotions is emotions haven't had a great um, PR guy working for them and that they can have a bit of a bad rap. Um, but emotions exist for a purpose and emotions aren't bad in and of themselves. So if we take our shark example, if you're swimming in the ocean, particularly on an evening, and maybe you've got a whole bunch of fish guts hanging around you or something or an open wound and you're swimming around in the ocean, and you notice a fin in the water heading your way. If you did not feel some anxiety then, then that's a problem. Uh, the anxiety is there to help you. Our emotions aren't all bad. Um, it's often just what happens with those emotions is where life can get a bit messy and tricky. But emotions in and of themselves are actually useful things. Um, I want to share just briefly um, from a Christian perspective on this too, if I can. From a Christian perspective, we believe that we are made in the image of God. And if you've ever spent any time flicking through the Bible or looking at the Bible or stories from the Bible, you will notice that the God who is described in there is an emotional type of guy. And if you read the, um, pro the books of the prophets in the Old Testament, you'll see a, a God who is full of all sorts of very strong emotions. We also see it in the life of Jesus and God made flesh in that there are numerous instances where he ex exhibits his emotions. When his friend Lazarus dies, 
he weeps. When he sees the um, temple being used as a marketplace, he gets angry and chases people out with a whip. Um, now, I'm not saying that you should take that as a manual for how to deal with anger in every situation, but just to say that um, God is an emotional being and we are made in his image. And so emotions um, are based on who he is, what he's like. Uh, now, I want to have a look at, with that in mind, why on earth we have them? What are their purpose? We get a bit of a clue from our friend the shark, but here's a couple of definitions which might help a little. I'm just going to read them to you. Emotions are understood to be feelings, largely physiological and manifestation, that occur in response to an experience, a thought, a thought process, a relationship, or as a result of a more pervasive mood state. Emotions exist in order to help us to build and navigate relationships and secondly, to act as motivating or driving forces in order to help us to act or make decisions. Again, if we think about our shark example, it helps with understanding uh, those definitions. We'll go to the next slide. Now, the second aspect that I want to look at here when we're looking at emotions is a, is a concept I'm going to talk about a bit tonight. And this is... Um, uh, probably, yeah, one of the key phrases to remember this evening, and that's this concept of emotion regulation. Now, emotion regulation refers to the ability to modulate or regulate your behaviour in the experience of an emotion. It's the ability to harness your emotions and channel them in productive rather than destructive ways. So an example might be, um, does anyone like watching uh, football? on TV. By football I mean rugby league. It has nothing to do with kicking a ball with your foot, it's more running into each other ball, but it's, it's a great sport. Um, and uh, when you watch that, you'll often notice that something happens where an outcome doesn't go a player's way and they are angry. And what can happen with that anger is that can be um, used in a couple of different ways. It can be used to um, run up at another player and punch them in the head um, or some sort of other illegal tackle and your team is penalised or you can regulate that emotion, which a lot of them do because they're paid money to do this you regulate that emotion regulate that anger and run the ball twice as hard as you would have if you weren't angry in the first place that's a picture of emotion regulation, it's using that emotion to, in a more effective way productive way. I'll go to the next slide. Now, I want to look at a little bit about what's going on in our brain when, um, when we're talking about emotion regulation issues. Um, so, I've got a diagram of the brain here, and I've just highlighted a couple of different areas. Um, now, let me just tell you a little bit about how your brain develops. So, when you're... Um, a baby in your mum's tummy, um, your brain tends to grow a bit like a flower, it buds like a flower, so sort of like this sort of thing. Um, if you've ever seen a flower bud, it's sort of like that, sort of like this. Very scientific explanation. It's as good as it gets. Um, and um, what that means is that the bits back here are older than the bits up here. So these bits start, and then it sort of grows from there. Um, now, interestingly, when we look at our little diagram here, a couple of areas that are connected with um, emotion expression, so the hippocampus and amygdala, they're sort of in this beginning part of the brain. They've been there from early on in our development. Then we've got other bits more towards the front, which is more right, butted towards, prefrontal cortex, which come later. And these areas are more connected with how you um, control or regulate your emotions. So I'll give you another example of what this looks like. Think of these areas back here as your emotional engine and these areas as your brakes. And when you are born, your engine is very well developed, but your braking system is not. And you would notice this for anyone who's had a child is that when your child is born and they're taken out of their warm, comfortable jacuzzi and held up in a room where they don't 
um, recognise any of the sensations, it's bright, it hurts their eyes, it's freezing cold, um, and they feel very exposed. They don't open their sweet little mouth and look mum in the eye and say, thanks mum, that must have been hard. Good on you, and thank you dad for sitting there and letting mum swear at you for four hours. There's nothing like that. Um, they just open their mouth and they just scream because the expression of emotion is fully developed. The ability to control or regulate it is not. And you see all through a child's development that generally the younger they are, the poorer they are regula regulating their emotions. When I was a, a toddler, I was quite a chubby toddler, um, quite chubby. Um, and that was because I was the first child born into my family, an extended family. So I lived, lived it up until, um, until my baby sister came and ruined that um, 18 months later. Um, and and I, I've been told stories and I've seen photos of me in this you know, large form. And I didn't walk to 18 months, I didn't need to. Um, and I would just cry any time I didn't have either a steak or a piece of chocolate cake in my chubby little hands. Um, now, the feelings that I felt back then around when I'm hungry are not too different from the feelings that I feel now. And what's changed is how I regulate those feelings. So now if I'm hungry, I don't just plop myself on the ground and scream till someone puts chocolate cake or steak in my hands. Uh, I might feel that way, but I have a different way of dealing with that, that emotion. My braking system has actually gotten better. And actually, when, they, um, when we look at scans of um, this uh, frontal lobe at the front of our brain, when you're a newborn baby, it's quite thin. It's like sort of paper thin, and the, and the brain cells are all very disorganised, not really connected to each other. But um, when you're older and you scan that part of your brain again, it's physically thicker and the cell connections are much more sophisticated. So again, in terms of break, your breaking pad has gotten better as you, are, as you get older. Now, we can still all get back into the back of our brain here, all of us. Um, I won't share too many personal stories, but I'm sure if you think back to even just the past month, there's probably an occasion where you can feel like you were in the back of your brain. Um, and when that happens, um, your emotional expression can be quite strong, your regulation not amazing. Now we're fully developed adults, we have a frontal lobe that finished developing approximately when we're about 30-ish. Some people, mm, <laughs> if it did. Um, but generally by about 30-ish it's, it's sort of finished. But if you're a child and growing up and that part of the brain is still developing, you're going to be prone to a lot more overloads and meltdowns than, than adults are. And so this explains why kids tend to be um, a bit more wild with their emotions when they're young. I'll go to the next slide. So what I want to look at now is um, how we're going to help kids regulate their emotions. This is a key part of building resilience. By the way, if at any point you have a question, you'd like to jump in, you'd like to ask me anything, feel free. We will have some questions at the end. But I know that sometimes I can be a bit like this in conversation. You know when you think of something good to say and then it moves on. It could be awkward to bring it back, you know in 10 minutes later when we move off and talk about football or talking about chicken or something. So, um, so if you do have something that you'd like to jump in with that you feel is going to escape your mind, that's fine as well. Um, but we'll have more time at the end. So now I want to look at a framework for what to do to help children to regulate their emotions. Now, the framework I like to think of when working with children, with families, is very really simple. It's about what to do before a child has a meltdown, and what to do during a child's meltdown, and what to do after a child's meltdown. So before, during, and after. 
you kind of think of it a bit like having a bushfire or a flood plan. You've got things that you do beforehand that are preventative, then you have things that you do during if it happens, and there's things that we do after when we've got some damage and need to work stuff out and try to hopefully have it not happen as much again. So let's look at first things, which is before. Can anyone tell me what this is a diagram of? Iceberg, yeah. Um, so apparently these things exist out there somewhere. We don't see heaps of them in Australia, but um, they're large chunks of ice that float around in the ocean. And the thing with icebergs apparently is that the majority of their mass is under the water, and not actually above the water. Um, I think some icebergs can get up to like about a 200 metres tall above the above sea level, which is pretty tall. Um, and then apparently icebergs can be 80% of their mass under the water. So whatever that is, by 200 divided by 10 times an hour. It's lots, lots of, lots of ice <laughs> under the surface. Um, the reason I put an iceberg up there is because when we're talking about what to do with, um, with children before they have a meltdown, this iceberg principle is very helpful. We've got to remember that children are experiencing emotions for a reason, and that doesn't necessarily mean the way they're expressing their emotions is the best way to do it, but they're feeling something for a reason. And so often the best place to start is to try to explore, well, what's going on underneath? Why are they feeling these feelings to begin with? I'll give you a simple example, and then we'll look at some specific areas that it's worth thinking about whenever a child is having trouble regulating their emotions. Um, but I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but um, Christmas Day is a wonderful day um, until evening time, and then it's not so wonderful anymore. Um, children start to fall to bits. Um, and it's not because they've been possessed by the devil at that point. There's other reasons that are contributing. Can anyone guess as to why your children might be falling to pieces on Christmas night? Yep. Tiredness. Tiredness, yep. Overstimulated. Overstimulated, yep. Disappointment. Disappointment, yeah. <laughs> not enough Lego. Yeah, yep. Sugar overload. Sugar overload, yes. Yeah, been around grandparents, and grandparents could not give two hoots about your organic approach to feeding your children. They just want to give them as much sugar as they can. They're there for a good time, and then to send them back to you for the come down. So yeah, all those things could be contributing. Um, and it's worth thinking about uh, that sort of approach whenever a child is, is melting down. What sort of things have contributed here? So I'm going to give you a couple of little areas that you can think about when we're looking at what we can do before. So there's four um, main areas. So one is areas of basic need, the other is emotional strain, then the family system itself, and then lastly, medical or other more complex psychological factors. So let me go through a few to illustrate it. So areas of basic need, there's a few different ones within this. We go to the next slide. So a lot of the ones that we spoke about just then with Christmas Day, um, sleep, diet, physical exercise and general activity levels. Sometimes when your kid is just bouncing off the wall, it can be because they haven't used up enough of their energy uh, that day. Not always, but can be. Screen use as well, so too much screen use. It's not an area of basic need, I should have phrased that differently. Uh, there's nothing in uh, the UN um, rights of a child that talks about them having rights to a screen. Um, Access to education and health services and stable caregiving. Um, areas of emotional strain tends to be more when there is emotional strain within the family. So if we've been through something traumatic together, um, or if there is, um, so some examples of family trauma might be a death in the family, or having gone through something really wild, like dad maybe even being made redundant, or the stress that came from that, or being in a car accident, mental health issues that can happen for adults in the family, 
marital strain, all those sorts of things. Overlaps with the next area, which is looking at the family system itself, our um, marital or parental relationships, time spent with children, what our boundary setting and disciplines like, parental expectations and fear. All these sorts of things can play into our child's emotions. I often think the kids, when a, when a kid comes in to see me, um, child often has difficulties that we need to work through, but the child is also too somewhat of a little thermometer for the rest of the family as well. And that generally if a child is quite agitated and stressed out, there's often stress in the family as well. And lastly, uh, in terms of before, um, I think, do I have one more slide here on before? Oh yes, oh, yeah, I'll just I'll share this little story. So and talking about the um, family, uh, family system, um, I remember when um, our fourth child was born, um, feeling like evenings were quite tricky. You know that time between when you get home from work and when they go to sleep. You know, for me, with that time, it can be somewhat tricky sometimes. Um, and I remember um, my children's behaviour was not ideal around that time. They're terrific kids. They really are. I love them so much. The behaviour was not ideal. Um, and had this moment where I noticed that they were particularly, their behaviour was particularly not ideal around this time of the evening. Now, there are numerous factors which play into this. A lot of this we've spoken about before. Fatigue, hunger, you know, missing each other, all that sort of thing. Um, but it took me a little moment for one of my kids to realise what was going on. So. Um, I was in the middle of trying to put out some fires, um, not literal fires, just behavioural fires, and my three-year-old son was grabbing me by the hand, and he's a bit more of a quietly spoken fellow, so he was just, daddy, 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 yep, hang on mate, hang on, trying to put out all these different fires that were going on, um, daddy, daddy, it's like, fine, what is it bud? Um, he looks up at me with these big blue eyes, he just said to me, Daddy, there's a sunset and it's orange. And there's something about how he said the word orange that got my attention. You know, just when they're little and they're just, it's like there's a real effort to get their mouth around the words or something. Anyway, so I was like, okay, cool, that's great. He's like, Daddy, Daddy, come see it. So anyway, so we went out and sat on the back set and looked, like, looked at the sunset. This isn't a picture of the sunset, by the way. It's just what I found on, uh, on the internet. But to tell you the truth, the sunset we saw wasn't that amazing. It was pretty average. <laughs> anyway, I sat there on the back step with him, holding his hand, looking at the sunset, just looking at him, enjoying it. And uh, I realised sort of why our um, evenings have been so uh, stressful and, uh, and unpleasant. It's because I'd been stressed and unpleasant. Uh, and that was feeding into this whole cycle. Um, so taking time to reflect on what life's like for us as a family and the way that we're interacting as a family is a very helpful thing to do on a regular basis. And if you're not sure how you're going, ask someone close to you and they'll tell you. Um, if you're parenting with someone, so if you're married or partnered, they'll tell you. Um, and if not, maybe ask a kid. They might tell you as well, or a close friend. I'll go to the next slide. Okay, right. Now, we'll look at now moving on to um, during. What we can do during a meltdown. I've got a picture of a smoke alarm here uh, because we've got to remember something and I'll tell you why the smoke alarm's there in a second. But we've got to remember something very important when a child starts to have a meltdown. So I've spoken about what to do before and as much as you can, try and address those things before as much as you can, but you won't be able to do it all the time for everything. And, your kid will just melt down, even if you've got the world perfectly aligned for them and everything's magic, they can still melt down because they're kids. Um, and kids are little people and we're complicated. So, um, 
First thing to remember is that their emotions are primary for when they are melting down, so during. Their emotions are primary. That means you've got to deal with their emotions first. The reason I bring this up is because generally what's happened is there's something that's a bit of a prologue before they have their meltdown. So it might be that we've told them no about something and then they then proceed to then escalate to the point of a meltdown. And what we have temptation to be is to continue to proceed with following up on the boundary setting that we've been doing. But your child has melted down, is in the back of their brain and they can't hear anything you are saying to them. It's a bit like if you were to have a car accident and then I turned up on the scene and started telling you all the things you did wrong when you are driving just then and what you should do differently next time. How much will you take in versus how much will you push me in the face? Um, when you're in this part of your brain, you can't really respond to a lot of that sort of logical or, or, or rational type language. So I've got a picture of a smoke alarm because the analogy is this to help you remember. Is imagine you are watching something on... Um, Netflix or something, it's a series or a movie you've been hanging out to watch and you're sitting there and you're watching it and you're up to the climax of the film and the smoke alarm goes off. What will you do? What would you do? Would you keep watching? Maybe for a little bit, stretch it out for a few beeps. Um, eventually, probably what you do is you'll hit pause and you'll go and you'll check what's going on. You'll find out that something's burning in the oven and all that it needs to change a battery and you'll fix it. But then, do you forget about the movie and just, you know, leave it and never watch it ever again? Probably not. You come back to it. So when I talk about emotions being primary, it doesn't mean that addressing the emotion when it happens overrides everything else. It just means for that moment, for that time, it's our focus. And then once those emotions are back under control, we can get back to whatever we need to address with our child. I'll go to the next slide. So... The principles that we use for when we're trying to address emotions, strong emotions with children are called containment. This doesn't mean locking them in a cupboard. Um, containment is just a word come up, that was, came up by academics or people that don't work with families a lot. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it's the best they could come up with in their trial studies on 20-something-year-old uni students. So. Um, Strategies of containment. Containment is basically trying to help a child stay relatively safe and calm down while they learn to calm themselves down for themselves. But that doesn't sound as catchy as containment. So, um, Containment strategies, I like to think of them in terms of three different levels, and I'll show you how this works in a second, depending on how strong the emotion is. So depending how out of control it is. Think about it like a bushfire and you have a little warning system. This is a similar sort of thing, depending on what you need to do. So... Um, a level one uh, sort of um, expression of emotion or meltdown uh, would be we would just shift our language. So we'd stop trying to um, talk about you know, how they should get off that device and instead we would focus on their feelings and what are going on there. A level two is then when uh, they're no longer responding to our language and so we need to enact some co-coaching on trying to help them find something to settle down their feelings, so making them, helping them go for a little walk outside or have a cuddle or do some breathing. And level three is basically when, to hell with all that, they don't want anything to do with you. And so um, what we do is we just minimise our engagement, maximise safety till they've calmed down enough for us to try some level two strategies again. I will show in the next diagram how this works and talk us through a little bit. So we've got a little graph here. It's got time versus intensity. And um, we've got a pretty quick uptake on the intensity of our meltdown here. Now, you may, as a child starts to melt down, find that if you get in early enough with some level one strategies of just changing your language to focus on feelings, they might calm down a little bit. Um, if that's not successful, then you then move to level two and you try and find something to help them calm down. And if that's not successful, then at level three, we basically sort of try and minimise our engagement, keep them safe, and then once it's settled down a little bit more, we try again, trying to get something to help them settle down and then moving our language to um, talking to the emotion. Um, I'll give you a little explanation of sort of what I mean by talking to the emotion. Um, talking to the emotion just means helping you, helping your child understand that you get sort of how they're feeling and helping them to make sense of those feelings. Um, 
I remember one of the first schools I worked at, there was a boy who had a bad temper and he'd just come back from being suspended. He was, he was at, um, one of my regular visitors in my office and he, um, he was playing handball and I happened to be going past to go to the toilet and um, one of the other children saw me and said, Sir, sir. Um, Cause I just think every adult in the school is a teacher. And I could actually do something about it. Said, so, um, you know, little Billy's about to hit some of the head with a rock. You know, a huge big rock he got out of sandstone rock he got out of the garden with superhuman strength. And he was all set to throw it at some kid's head. Um, now, um, this principle is fresh in my mind around talking to emotions when I saw him. And um, I just want to share this story with you as an example of when it works rather than an example of when I had something thrown at me. Um, so for this little boy, I just went over to him and said, Billy, what's going on? You look really mad. And he told me, using some other language, which I won't repeat this evening, that yes, he was indeed very mad and that uh, he wanted to kill little Johnny for cheating in handball. Um, and in which case, my natural tendency as an adult would be, well, you don't kill anyone, mate. That's a stupid idea. You put the rock down, and the rock's thrown at my head. Um, but instead, keeping the language around his emotions, we're able to calm him down eventually. So I just bounced it back to him again. And just said, well, okay, right on. So it sounds like um, you feel like these kids always cheat and pick on you, and that's what's made you so mad. Yeah, that's right. And more colourful language, whatever just keeping bouncing back to him that understood how he was feeling, did manage to avert the rest of the meltdown. This doesn't work every time, but it's just to give you an example of the sort of language that's helpful when a child's melting down. Again, if I come back to my car accident analogy, if I've had a car accident, I don't want you lecturing me about my driving. I want you to say something to me like, whoa, that must've been frightening for you. Yes, it was, thank you. That's what you're after. Focusing on the feeling first. And then, if they're not responding to that, then we move through it up, up our categories. It's important to note, too, that we come back down the same way as well. So depending how agitated your child is, you then look at which sort of strategies we're going to use. So once they've calmed down a little bit, and generally at level three, sort of they're having time alone. If you want to know if it's time for you to give them a cuddle or talk them through something, generally it's when we get to... Um, if they'll let you anywhere near them. And generally they've come down to level two and you can, you can walk through something with them. And anyway, I'll move on to the last section now and I'll take some questions to flesh it out a little bit more. But the last little section here is what to do after. Um, and I've drawn a little spot here on this diagram of what we do after when a child has um, calmed down enough. Is we probably need to have a little post-meltdown conversation. Now this is where we get to all our juicy bits of trying to help them change their behaviour for next time. And so part of the post-meltdown conversation is that we continue with our empathy, helping them understand, I get why this was a hard for you, why you felt the way you did. We're not saying it was okay what they did, but just empathising with their experience. Then we have 20% of our conversations, we talk about what the problem was and what we could possibly do differently next time. If they react a bit at this point, they need more empathy. And so give more empathy and then come back to it again. And then the last 10% is your follow-up and your consequences. Now, I want to talk quickly about um, consequences, just quickly, if we look at the next slide. Um, so consequences are often required after. Now, they're often required after because generally meltdowns can follow trying to administer a consequence or a boundary, and you need to hold the line with it after the meltdown's finished. But also, too, because children can engage in disrespectful behaviour when they're melting down. And disrespectful behaviour always needs follow-up. It doesn't mean you follow it up at the time when they're melting down, because remember, they're in this part of the brain. But certainly once they've calmed down, it's worthwhile following it up. It's important for them to know that if they engage in that behaviour, even if they are upset, it's, it's not OK. Um, so some criteria for when we're looking at how we then would manage boundaries, um, uh, some, uh, some consequences, is you look at a few things. So are the boundaries being set for disrespectful behaviour? So are you having this conversation because they were disrespectful in something they did? If they were, then continue. Um, uh, are the boundaries consistent? Uh, or are you just 
introducing something new, in which case you can't really give a consequence for something they didn't know they couldn't do. Um, and thirdly, are you administering any boundaries calmly and clearly? It's important to remember that boundary setting is not about control. You can't make your child do anything. Um, generally, that's what babies are for when you're trying to get them to sleep, is to try and get your around, head around the idea that you can't make them do anything. You can rub their head with lavender oil, you can sing to them, you can rock them until you, you know, feel like passing out. The child will sleep when it wants to sleep. There are things that can help, but you can't make your child do anything. Our job is to um, influence their behaviour by controlling the outcomes of their choices. And there's a bit of a difference. Big difference. Uh, the last thing I would say, and then, um, then we'll wrap up, is that in this follow-up afterwards, what's also very important is to reconnect with your child. Um, you don't discipline in a void. You don't manage meltdowns in a void. It's in a relationship. This is a relationship that you have with the child and it's a very unique and special relationship. Um, and after you've given some sort of little post-meltdown conversation, it's very important, I think, to close it off and let them know that your relationship is still okay. And I've found that these three reassurances help address the three main fears that children have when it comes to their poor behaviour. And those three main fears are that you don't love them or like them, that they are a bad kid, and that you are holding a grudge. Um, and these three reassurances, I encourage families to use them almost like a mantra after every big meltdown moment, just to clear those fears for your child. Let them know that you love them, they're a good kid, and that you forgive them. Even if you don't feel like any of those things at the time, <laughs> it's important to do it. And the thing I've noticed too is that generally, if you look them in the eye and say those three things, generally your feelings will catch up with the words that you're saying soon enough. It's very hard to look your child deep in the eye and say to them, I forgive you, and not all of a sudden realise that you are holding a grudge um, and that you love them to bits and you do actually forgive them. So I always encourage families to look at those three afterwards. So look, as I said, a lot of content, and I don't mind if you don't remember all of it. It's a framework for thinking about how to help kids with their emotions. Um, but hopefully there's been a couple of things in there that you might want to think about, might want to help, um, and might help with how you help your child manage their emotions. And your emotions aren't the bad things, even your kids not the bad, bad guy here either. Just helping them know how to regulate them appropriately. And I find that this framework is helpful um, in teaching kids to do that. So that's all I wanted to present tonight. I want to open it up now to questions and see what you would like to ask around this and uh, emotions in general for children. So who would like to be brave and ask the first question? Right. Um, so sometimes when my kids are having a lot my concern is that it's happening in front of the others. Yep. And is it is it more than to be a learned behaviour? There has so many older ones that we have, but the other ones are like, What's your advice? So so my concern is that, that this is a very public meltdown. Yep. Yep. Yeah, good question. Um, I think a general sort of principle that um, I default to is that wherever possible, protect your child's dignity. Um, so with most tricky moments we need to have with our child, the most tricky conversations, it's best to do that without the audience of the other children, um, wherever possible. But, um, but if it's becoming an issue of control, sometimes you've got to be creative about that. So for instance, if you're saying, mate, can we go outside to talk about this? Or can we go somewhere else and he doesn't want to? Um, then rather than turning that into a battle, you'd probably look at how you could move the others away while it's dealt with. The other thing that can happen too is that 
Unfortunately, that's part of being in a family is that we do see the best and worst of each other. And those things can still be teaching tools too for the other kids. And so to explain it afterwards and talk about what happened and talk about why you did what you did, why what's happening for that child was happening for that child. Um, again, while protecting the child's dignity. Um, same as when we have a meltdown too. It's helpful to explain what happened, what could have been done differently. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. How did your framework change dependent on the gender or the age of the child? Um, I think the it would it changes more based on what they're responding to within that framework. So I think the principles within the framework might change a bit. So the language that I would use, for instance, if we're talking level one sort of strategies, if I was doing that with a young child, um, I wouldn't be using long sentences or too many complex words. It'd be things like, I know you're sad. I wouldn't say that to a 15 year old. <laughs> I'd change the language for that. And similarly for a, for a toddler, you know, an appropriate um, level two sort of strategy where I'm trying to walk them through something might be like, um, come on, how about we go on the trampoline for a little bit and bounce off some of that, some of that frustration. Um, again, I wouldn't do that with a teenager. Um, I mean, some teenagers would probably love it still, but um, getting them out there is another thing. Um, so it's more probably the, the type of approach you would use within that overarching principle. So I think the framework, if you think of it in terms of being uh, a principle-based thing, and then the application or how you apply those principles to the child, depending on their age and gender, varies. And can I just say on that too, there is no shortcut in that case for knowing your child and knowing them well, knowing what sort of language is going to work, knowing what sort of things are going to be helpful to settle them down, knowing how getting what ways of getting space work for them as well. Mm. Great question. Mm. Yes? Yep. So, um, so the personality of it, I'm not used to it, but so, so dealing with that, like I so, I just need to go through straight away yep. to remove them. Yep. Temperament's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, I think this when I when I remember I'm watching like um, so I've got a brother-in-law who's into extreme sports, and so I've often I went and saw I think it was Crusty Demons, I think they were called. And they were here. It's a great show. It was really a lot of fun. Like there's this huge, huge ramp, and um, they rode down it on an esky and did this jump. Anyway, on that night, some of the guys um, broke bones, right? And they would, so the guy on the esky would go shroom and then crash and oh, be twitching on the ground. And then, you know, someone would run out to him and then he'd jump up and be like, yeah! And up he'd go again, right? Um, I'm not saying that's where your child's headed, but. <laughs> yeah. What I'm saying is that some kids they would see an injury or something and be like, right, well, oh, that's enough for me. Others, um, doesn't phase them so much. Now, there is a bit of temperament involved. What I'd probably encourage you in is a couple of things. One is to work out what makes it funny for him and see if you can minimise those things, which I think you've already done a bit of by just trying to get rid of the audience, you know, just off you go. Um, keeping it short. Um, maybe to being mindful of how agitated you are when you're talking to him. There's this phrase often used um, in behavioural psychology when you're disciplining a child or giving them a consequence, is to um, do what we call attachment neutral in your, your, your approach. So to use plain language with that, 
imagine you're a politician at a press conference talking about a tax reform. Um, so you just keep it bland, simple, no raised voice, no riddle to change anything. But he hits on, so you have to go and walk off and just sort of, if you feel it's an audience thing. The other thing I'd encourage you to is that generally your child's reaction is not always um, a helpful indicator as to whether your consequences are working. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that comes out in terms of behavioural literature and whether a consequence brings change is whether it's done consistently. So if the reaction is sometimes big, sometimes not, don't let that stress you too much, just be consistent. sort of proximity between the events when you follow it up. Um, if you feel like it's been too long, then you're probably right. Again, if you know your child, you've got a fair idea. So with a really young child, like with, with toddlers, for instance, um, you've really got to do it pretty immediately. Otherwise, it just confuses them and frustrates them. They don't get the connection. With a, a teenager or a, a primary school age kid, you've got a bit more time. Generally what I think once you've got a sort of primary school age and beyond, it shouldn't extend past the day. So if you haven't had that conversation by the end of the day, forget it. Yeah. Um, I, I think too, something else I'd say with that, is that when you come to have that conversation, sometimes your post-meltdown conversation is going fine until we get that 10% at the end where we need to talk about. And because you threw your Duplo creation at my head, your Duplo is being packed away, for the next 24 hours, you may at that point see that the um, we have another meltdown. Um, and in which case, um, you just repeat the whole um, curve again, um, but you probably don't really need to do much else at the end of it just except hold the line. Yeah, wouldn't keep adding things on, adding things on, adding things on. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. Um, probably every year I'll have at least one or two 17, um, 18 year old boys come into my um, office um, and they're in big trouble. They've um, committed some sort of assault or something along those lines, they've been in a fight, police have been involved. Um, and I'll ask them about it and they'll say that exact same thing to me. Well, he made me angry. Um, it's really difficult working with a, a person at that age where that whole concept has just been concreted into their thinking. So I get what you're saying. You want them to separate that out from a young age. And so I think it all comes back to, if you apply this sort of principle of following up things afterwards, I think they do start to capture a bit of it. Because if you're spending time um, helping them settle their emotions and then lots of that empathy language talking about how they're feeling, you're being really clear that the feelings are okay. And you might even talk in that 20% section, well, next time you're frustrated at your sister, just say, yeah, I'm really angry at you, and then come tell me that you're really angry at her, and we can work out what to do. So we're being really clear that it's okay to say you're upset. Also, too, if you never discipline a child for telling you how they feel, um, that's always helpful as well. Um, but in terms of understanding the difference between feeling and behaviour, language that I often use in 
uh, sessions with children is that of our feelings and our choices. So being really clear that it's a choice. It's not just a reactive behaviour that happens. Yes, you felt angry, but then you chose to um, say those words to your, to your sister. And that's what I'm following up with you. I don't mind that you were upset with her. That's fine. I get it. She was being really annoying. Um, but there, that choice, that wasn't a great choice. And having that accountability with a consequence for it. Because if I get in trouble with the police, if I'm at the uh, pub and somebody criticises the team I'm going for or something, and I get really mad and I punch them in the face, when the police come to present charges to me, the fact that he made me angry is not going to count for much at all. Uh, he made me angry, yes, yeah, so what? You had a choice with what you did with that. So, important to introduce that, yeah. 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 Really good. Mm. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, it's difficult for me probably to, um, if we're thinking about a particular child in general, I can just sort of give some general sort of principles. Kids can feel that way for a number of different reasons. Um, but um, what can be helpful, often for children who have a fear of failure, there's a there's a couple of things. One is that it's either a fear that people are going to respond badly to them, um, so they're going to laugh at them or give them a hard time, whatever it might be. Um, and or it can also be that um, the only thing that matters is the result. And so what I find really helpful with children in general who struggle with a bit of that, sort of, you know, performance anxiety, I guess, is to... Um, try and take the focus off the result and put it more on the, on the process. Um, because really, I mean, I remember, um, example I think of is the Olympics in 2000, when um, Kathy Freeman won gold medal. It was a big, big moment, because um, we don't often win gold medals in athletics. And um, you know, she lit the torch and everything. It was a big occasion. It was like the most watched event of all time in the whole world ever uh, at that point. At least that's what we thought here in Australia. Um, and remember the race and the hype around her and she was wearing that ridiculous space age suit. But she ran a perfect race and won the gold medal and they were interviewing her afterwards, you know. She's exhausted and they stick a microphone. Bruce McAvaney, remember to stick a microphone in the face. He said, oh, Kathy, how do you feel? Um, and, and just asking her what she was thinking, you know, thinking about it. She said, oh, I was just thinking, I'm oh, just one foot in front of the other. Um, and because if you focus on your process, you'll end up getting the results of your file. And, and it's the same with children. What we do is we focus on process. We focus on effort. And we put our rewards and our praise and our treats into that, that sort of thing. Because um, often the way life's geared is that the big fanfare happens for your result. We want to make a big fanfare for your process. And more specifically with process, um, you want to focus on um, character attributes. Yeah. So sometimes it can be helpful to have a list of things and as a family that we're focusing on that we really want to you know, build up and perseverance might be one of those things or having a go or sticking out things. And you make that a targeted, rewarded thing that we're going to focus on as a family. And you catch them out doing it and make a big fuss over it. Although, although, just one thing I will say about this. Depending on your child's temperament, um, they might not thrive on a big fuss. So um, you may just have to, you still want to have high frequency rewards for that behaviour. But you might just have to play it a bit cooler if their temperament is like, don't make a scene around. So sometimes just a quiet little treat, a little pat on the head, a little kiss, and come on, buddy, I noticed that your little stick up there is enough. Yeah, for those two kids. Mm. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Do you have one more? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Sure. So I recently get where you do gaslighting. Yep. Um, 
Sometimes with kids who are um, trying to put a spin on an event, um, it's best not to get into like a um, loyal, loyally debate with them. Um, what that does is it gets them better at spin. Um, if you're sort of saying, oh, that's not the case, well, oh, well, so, 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 so. Um, I think don't give them the practice. Um, so, I don't mind if it's a good debate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's fine, we want them to debate, we just don't want them to be disrespectful. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's, that's where I think it's, that's where yeah. I'm worried about eventually. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not yeah, so chuck him in the debating team, get him in public speaking, have him... He's very shy, so he only debated with us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but when it comes to disrespectful behaviour, yeah, try not to engage in those arguments. What I find is helpful to do with children when they're trying to put spin on something or just lie to you about something is to just say to them, uh, buddy, you and I both know the truth um, and we're going to act on that. Uh, oh, but such and such, you and I both know the truth. And then just go with that. You can only do that if you're 100% sure, by the way, but <laughs> tell them where they're... Yeah, that's right, that's right. And if you don't know, well, well, what I would say is if you don't know, is you say to them, okay, buddy, I'm going to trust you, because I trust you, because that's how relationships work. And you walk off, and you leave it. And generally what will happen is a couple of things. One is that will eat away at him, <laughs> and then he'll come in a bit later and sort of like, oh, Dad, I think I forgot um, something before. Um, and come clean, or he'll be like, yes, it works, and, and that's okay too, because what you do is you just wait, you just be patient, because eventually the truth always comes out, and then when it does, what you do is you have follow-up that is commensurate to the length and the effort of the deceit. Um, this is what happens with politicians all the time, right? We don't always know when there's corruption at the time, but later on, when we find it's been going on for years, the consequences are far bigger than if they just come clean at the beginning and so they've got a conflict of interest. So, um, if you're not sure, there's still, still things you can do as well, but um, generally, just say, you and I both know the truth, go with that. But if he is fitting, say, I trust you and wait for it to be shown otherwise. Do it then. Mm. Yeah. So one of the biggest things we've noticed um, in our middle school, um, yep. one of the biggest things I've noticed is um, the anxiety of kids and not wanting to come to school whenever they're faced with a challenge or a difficulty. And I guess that iceberg analogy, you know, and you're probably better off dealing with everything leading up to that rather yep. than the moment where it gets to the point they can't come to school. Yep. But I'd um, yeah, I'd love just to hear some words on building resilience, I guess, in, in, in kids when they see when those first few disappointments or things go against them, you start to see that slippery slope. Because I know when they're on it, it's very hard to get them. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. And, and what can happen is you get just caught up with the tip of the iceberg, like you're saying, which becomes a battle about getting to school, when maybe if we can sort of work on some of the bulk of the mass underneath, that can, that can bring some relief. Um, yeah, I think a large part of it too um, does come down to, and it's hard, different kids, different situations. Sometimes kids are strongly school avoided because they can be on a tablet all day if they're at home. Um, so there are different reasons as to why kids can be avoiding. It's important to remember or try and explore what that might be for that particular kid. Um, but in terms of helping kids get more comfortable with being uncomfortable, we've got to work more deliberately at this 
um, in our particular culture, in our particular moment of history. I think one of the things with COVID that happened here was that um, it shocked our comfortable way of living. Now, it's not to say people didn't go through real hardships, in it, but we live in a fairly, um, children particularly, as adults it's harder, but children live generally this almost sort of charmed existence with things now. And um, I think delayed gratification, uh, being bored, being frustrated, having to persist with things, Games are very easy and quick now. You're not making model submarines anymore. You're not building forts in the bush anymore. Things that took time and required pushing through boredom, frustration, conflict, all that sort of stuff. So I think what can help is as families, if we're looking for ways where we can encourage and have regular delayed gratification in tasks, regular moments where they've got to push through discomfort, where we've got to actively go looking for those things because what we have in our society is a lot of stuff that's very comfortable. Yeah. Could we please, uh, could we please give thank you. Thank you. That's been excellent, Asha. It's, uh, it's one of those things, isn't it? You're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, oh like thinking about all the different ways that even I responded just today. I, did, I had, uh, in our place, in our place, I think the smoke alarm goes off in the morning. Uh, I'm not great in the morning when I'm getting my kids to school because I'm, you know, needing to get here and I'm not at my best then and I wasn't at my best this morning. So I need to get home to have one of these conversations. <laughs> um, one of the things to also say is that uh, um, one of the debrief, a debrief structure um, that I find really useful, and you can just Google this, it's the five restorative questions. And that brings a lot of accountability for the student and no judgment from the teacher. So the five questions are, um, tell me what happened. Um, what were you thinking at the time? What have you thought about since? Who's been affected by what you did? That's, that's the killer, right? That's the one where you get the tears and everything, right? And because you just keep saying, who else? Who else? Who else? Right? And then, and then you say to them, um, what can you do to make it right? I haven't said anything as the principal to them. They've, it all, it, it's all there for themselves. But um, those five restorative questions I, is a structure that I use all the time when I'm talking with students post an incident. Yeah. Okay. So that's been excellent. We, yeah, thank you for coming along. And we could have asked questions for a long time. It's been really useful for us as parents. And, um, and I love your vision for families. And, uh, and, and that has certainly been um, the result of your coming here tonight. So we want to thank you. Can we thank Asher Morrison again?